Madam Deputy Speaker, pleasure to see you. Here we are again. Always a pleasure to see you in the chair. And, um, and we, for once, we're not in a rush. So uh, it'll be dark outside before we finish. Uh, so thank you. And uh, congratulations to my humble friend from North Dorset for entertaining us and educating us and setting out his stool very well um, and securing today's debate. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, cancer survival in our country, let's start with a, a plus um, and a positive, has never been better. Survival rates are at their best ever, improving every year since 2010, which is something that we should celebrate and has, uh, has been long fought, been hard fought actually. So, you know, am amongst men, prostate cancer is the most common cancer in the UK. It's the second most common cause of cancer deaths. However, pr prostate cancer survival itself has tripled in the past 40 years. So with about 85% of men surviving for five or, f five or more years. I think it's worth saying at the, at the outset, there's obviously some people watch these debates who are maybe not, f not familiar. I mean, the prostate is obviously only found in men and, and produces some of the fluid in, in semen. It's found below the, below the bladder. It's about the size of a walnut. Um, it sort of surrounds the urethra. The, the tube that carries urine, obviously, from the bladder. Um, and, and the causes of prostate cancer are not, are not that well known, is the truth. You know, the strongest risk factor is age, but about 5 to 10% of prostate cancers are thought to be due to family history. And it's true that black men, whether of black African or black Caribbean origin, are more likely to develop prostate cancer than white men, and one in four will get the disease as opposed to one in eight of all men. Asian and Oriental men have got the lowest chance of developing prostate cancer, which is interesting. I always think we should look, um, look at this sort of data for, for the way that we look at our prevention, um, which I will come on to. And, and the way that prostate cancer develops it is also not fully understood, is the truth. So prostate cancer is not a single disease. It's a spectrum of diseases, ranging from slow-growing tumours... Uh, which may not cause any symptoms, may not shorten life at all, to very aggressive tumours which can kill, and, and we should remember that. I thought, it, it is, as I say, the, the strongest risk factor is age, but, but people of, of younger ages obviously get it as well. I, I have a, a, a school friend of mine who's recently contracted and, and beaten, and I'll come on to the language in a minute, prostate cancer. He may even be watching today's debate. He may be mowing the lawn, who knows, but um, we wish him well. I thought my honourable friend raised some very good points in his speech, and I, sh I think I should be able to touch on them all. It's very interesting he said, I mean, yes, it's a timely debate for all the reasons that he said. It's also a timely debate, of course, because it's World Cancer Day on Monday, um, and it was great to see the, the Palace of Westminster lit up in pink and blue with Cancer Research UK. And his, his point about language was really interesting, actually. Uh, and I, I don't know whether he saw, there was a poll by Macmillan that was, just came out just last month. And it, it said how many people with cancer are fed up with the language of war. So, you know, we often say cancer-stricken. We often say victim. We often call a person's cancer diagnosis that, a, a war, literally, or a battle, and saying that they, quote, lost their battle or, or lost their fight when they, when they pass away. And uh, it is no surprise, Madam Deputy Speaker, that articles in the media and posts on social networks were found to be the worst offenders. But um, be, be real is my honest advice, I suppose. Macmillan have launched a campaign to highlight the challenges posed when by a cancer diagnosis and the support that's available. It's called um, Right There With You. And Macmillan do as we all know, fantastic work and do a lot of work in this house and um, I would urge people to take a look at the Macmillan campaign. He also touched on the all-party group, which I know had one of its first gatherings this week, formed by our honourable friend, former nurse, the lady who represents Lewis, and Orchid, the male cancer charity, are going to be the secretary to that. And they're a charity that, I, that are not, not that well-known, um, but, but they're growing fast. I met them at Britain Against Cancer a couple of years ago and they're now part of my cancer roundtable work that I do every quarter here in the House and uh, I pay tribute to their work and to the All Party Group. I had a good conversation in the votes last night with the Honourable Lady from Lewis and, um, and there's an awful lot that we're going to do together and I think that's, that's really, really important that that group, you know, if it didn't exist, it needed to be invented and, and well done to her for, for inventing it. So let's, let's start with early diagnosis, shall we, because that was a point that my Honourable Friend mentioned in his speech. Now, obviously, the biggest weapon that we have in successfully treating cancer is early diagnosis. I have said many times, as did the former chair of the All-Party Group on Cancer, um, that it is cancer's 
magic key, magic bullet, and that is true. Now, of course, there are many cancers uh, where early diagnosis is all but impossible. We don't see presentation of symptoms until it's very late, and then it becomes incredibly difficult, and they're going to be an incredible challenge for the cancer ambition that I'll come on to talk about in a moment. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, since we men, as my honourable friend also said and others said in interventions, are notorious for not visiting the doctor at the first sign of concerning symptoms, although I think that is changing, um, anything that can raise awareness of prostate cancer where early diagnosis is indeed the magic key is, of course, to be welcomed. And I, and I pay tribute to public figures like Stephen Fry um, and Bill Turnbull from BBC News for speaking out so honestly about their prostate cancer diagnosis and providing an invaluable, I think, public service in doing that and in raising the profile and awareness of the disease and giving some men the vital nudge that they need to go and see their GP if they think something isn't right. For some men, it can be a, a a quick burst of symptoms that come on very quickly and they, they can go to a doctor and, and be seen and be treated um, and have surgery in a very, very short space of time. For others, it can be a very slow burn. And just going back to, to Stephen Fry and Bill Turnbull, I mean, I, I hope that the work that they've done and the others that come forward, we, you know, we'll see a similar impact that we did 10 years ago when Jay Goody, the TB personality following her, her cervical cancer diagnosis, which... which tragically she she died from um, spoke about how vital it was that women attend their smear tests and we had an excellent debate in Westminster Hall last week around Natasha's army there's there's the uh, the word again Natasha was a 31 year old mother from Newton Abbott who um, died of cervical cancer leaving four young children just before Christmas and Natasha's army are her friends and family who campaign around awareness and the issues around smear tests so so important and the work that Jade Goody did Madam Deputy Speaker led to a huge uptake in screening enabling the NHS to detect and treat more cancers early and I hope that we can do that as more people talk about their prostate cancer, of course. Can, can I thank the Minister for giving way and can I join in in congratulating those people like Stephen Fry and also the grassroots movements that he's uh, talking about, doing such a good job uh, uh, talking about the importance of early diagnosis. Um, his friend talked about this important PSA test and be grateful if he could, he may not have the figures available, but if he did, could he let us know how many men over 50 uh, uh, actually, as a proportion of those men over 50 have actually had this test, it would be an interesting indicator as to what's going on. Minister. I don't have it uh, with me today, Madam Deputy Speaker, but, uh, but, uh, but I'll tell you what I will do. I will, um, I will write to those members that are in today's debate and I'll, and I'll, I'll t tweet it. I'll tweet it out as well, um, at Prime Minister on Twitter. Enough of the advert. So, <laughs> I don't know where I came up with that one. Anyway, so... Early diagnosis and the NHS long-term plan is where I want to go next. So, obviously, straight back after Christmas recess, we launched the NHS long-term plan, which is a seismic piece of work. You know, and it would be the first to say, as would many people working clinically in this field, that we can't rely solely on the celebrity cases that I mentioned to improve early diagnosis. So the, um, the long-term plan included a comprehensive package of measures that will be rolled out across the country with the aim of of securing that Prime Minister's promise that my honourable friend spoke about that was launched at a party conference back in the autumn, that three quarters of all cancers will be detected at early stage, so stage one, stage two, in which they are obviously the most beatable by 2028. Uh, the plan will provide new investment in state-of-the-art technology to transform the process of diagnosis and boost research and innovation with the aim of ensuring 55,000 more people are surviving cancer for five years in England every year from that date. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, this ambition refers to all cancers, including prostate. A number of people, when we made that ambition, when we came out with that, in the breast cancer community, for instance, said, but, but what about us? Because we're already at, uh, above 75%. Some of the rarer and less survivable cancers said, what about us? And this ambition does refer to all cancers, and I think it's very important that I restate that at the dispatch box. Uh, not just those that afflict men or women, old or young, easily treatable or more difficult and less survivable. So we're clear that to achieve the five-year survival ambition, we've got to improve outcomes for all cancers, and, and we will. So as I've said, early diagnosis is obviously key to this, and, uh, and early diagnosis of prostate cancer 
is challenging is the truth because its symptoms are similar to those of an enlarged prostate and, and very often, as I said before, there can be no symptoms at all. Now, as said, the most common method of identifying an increased risk of, of localised prostate cancer is the, the prostate-specific antigen, PSA test for short. However, that is not perfect. Um, you will have seen Madam Deputy Speaker press reports a year or so ago that a, that a raised PSA level is not necessarily a sign of prostate cancer and a low PSA level is not necessarily a sign of it not being there either, which is not entirely helpful. But we must always remember in these debates... And I'm not a doctor, as is clear, that, that medicine is not an exact science. And I thought that story was a very good, good example of that. So a raised PSA level can indicate prostate cancer, as I say, but in some cases it can miss indicating a cancer. It can also suggest a cancer where, when there isn't one, or identify slow-growing tumours that may never cause any symptoms to the, to the man or shorten. His, his natural life scan. And this can be all very difficult in primary care. And my humble friend talked about GPs, and there is a clue in the name. And I get a lot of flack sometimes for saying this, but general practitioners are so called for a reason. They are general practitioners. And I think sometimes we should remember the devilish job that, that general practitioners have in, in the, the huge variety that comes through their door. So the Prostate Cancer Risk Management Programme, I want to talk about that, PCRMP, we love our acronyms in the health service, that was established so that men considering a PSA test are given information about the benefits of doing so, the limitations of doing so, which I've touched on, and the associated risks. Now, it supports those GPs that I was just speaking about in giving and discussing that information with their male patients. There's a pack of materials available for primary care to help men make an informed choice about the PSA test, which includes a leaflet they can take away and discuss with partners. There's also an evidence booklet and a summary sheet for GPs, and these are all widely available online. As, I, as I've said, there are pros and cons of having a PSA test, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's so important that men arm themselves, though, with as much information as they can and speak to their GP or their practice nurse um, as they go for the, the NHS health checks, for instance, which I will be going for at the end of this month, Madam Deputy Speaker. I know it is hard to believe, but I am old enough to be called for one. And they phoned me yesterday, so I have been booked in. Um, as has been said, men over 50 have the right to be given a PSA test free on the NHS once they've discussed the advantages and disadvantages of such with their GP. The PCRMP that makes this very clear to GPs and having discussed the pros and cons, no one over 50 should be told no, as we've heard today, and I will, I will find those figures. I agree that they will be very interesting. Just wanted to touch on screening, if I may, then, Deputy Speaker. Yes? I, 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 I'm very, very grateful, and um, the, the detail with which the Minister is setting it out is, is customary. Could I just ask, uh, in a circumstance where all of those conversations have taken place, but if the patient says, Effectively, I, thank you, Doctor. I hear what you say, but I'm entitled to have this test. I want to have this test done. Can he confirm that GPs then are obliged to make the referral rather than say, well, I've heard what you've said, but I'm your doctor and I'm not going to let you have it done? Well, we don't often talk, we don't often use this term anymore, very, very often, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I, I always remember the former Health Secretary, now Lord Lansley, using the expression a lot of no decision about me without me. And that is still very true. So, you know, a, a patient has every right over that age to, to request a PSA test. And if they believe that they, they, they had symptoms, then certainly more so. And, you know, I would be very concerned of a, of a GP, and I think it would be extremely unlikely for a GP to refuse it in those instances. But of course, any patient has the right of travel and every patient has the right to, to change GP if they're, if they're not satisfied with the relationship they have. So you know, if, any, if, any, if, if he did know of an instance like that, I'd be very interested to hear about it, um, as I suspect with the Royal College, but I would be very surprised. just want to touch on screening, Madam Deputy Speaker, because we talk a lot about screening at the moment and, and, I'll, and I'll come on to why. So because of the limitations of the PSA test, there is currently no national screening programme for prostate cancer. So in 2016, Prostate Cancer UK, who have been rightly lauded this afternoon, they began work to help develop tests which could form part of a national screening programme. And this would potentially involve better blood tests that are currently in development, combined with more advanced scanning. Now, they're hoping to make this happen in the next five years. 
nothing happens quickly in, in this space, unfortunately, and, I, and I'm sure we all would welcome their efforts. But members will be aware, and I've spoken about it quite a lot in the House recently, we've had a number of cancer debates since Christmas, that Sir Mike Richards is leading a review uh, for the Secretary of State of our current screening programmes. And as part of that, and I met with Mike last month, we will consider how we can make screening smarter, targeted those most at risk. Now, we expect Sir Mike's work will have positive implications for future programmes. He's an incredibly experienced and respected figure in this space, and his work will enable us, I hope, to roll screening out faster when the evidence base is there to support it. And I'm very hopeful and ambitious, as I know is Sir Mike, for that work. Let's talk about public awareness campaigns, which is obviously mentioned by my humble friend in, in opening the debate. So the government has got to do all that it can to raise awareness of prostate cancer and target high-risk groups, while recognising there are limitations to how much the public will listen to public health messages from ministers at the dispatch box. I know, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is hard to believe that people do not take this <laughs> all to heart. Um, but they don't. So we work with our partners. So in 2014, uh, along with Public Health England, we worked on the phenomenally successful Be Clear on Cancer campaign, which has had a number of iterations on prostate cancer in black men. The campaign messaging included one in four black men will get prostate cancer, uh, was one of its taglines, and it urged um, these men over 45 that were concerned about their risk of prostate cancer to visit their GPs. And the campaign evaluation showed that it had stimulated new conversations about prostate cancer among families and the black community. And Public Health England has made all the materials developed for the campaign available online so groups and, and other organisations can use them locally if they wish. And they, they are they're very striking, they're very powerful, uh, and we believe they were very successful. And we also welcome the work that Prostate Cancer UK is doing with the Football Association to raise awareness through their, their Relegate Prostate Cancer campaign. It's fronted by high-profile celebrity football figures, including, of course, the England football manager Gareth Southgate, and includes the, the, the badge, um, the slogan, sorry, one man dies every 45 minutes from prostate cancer. And anyone who watches Match of the Day, you can stay awake for Match of the Day on a Saturday night, um, or thank goodness for the repeat on a Sunday morning. Uh, we'll see so many people in the... In, on the pundits and the managers interviewed afterwards wearing the badge that, that you see me wearing today. And uh, men, members will be very familiar with that badge, I know, which I think demonstrates a widespread support that Prostate Cancer UK has to continue to raise awareness of, of, of this disease. On research, Madam Deputy Speaker, just coming to, to a conclusion now. So research has played a crucial part in the advances we've made in cancer survival over the past four decades. So more than 15 years ago, the department identified the need for further research into prostate cancer. Uh, and we've since worked very closely with Cancer Research UK, who indeed were here this morning, and I was pleased to pop in for their, um, for their drop-in. Prostate Cancer UK, the Medical Research Council, and others through the National Cancer Research Institute, a strategic partnership of the major UK funders of cancer research. So NCRI spends specifically on prostate cancer research has increased from £17.1 million in 2011-12 to £26.5 million pound in 2015-16. Yes, of course on research. Does the Minister think that another thing that should be promoted against, uh, 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 amongst those who are diagnosed with cancer is to encourage them to take part in clinical trials that aid the research and help us find ways to, to halt or even cure uh, these horrendous diseases? But I think that it maybe it is underplayed and we should try and encourage as many people as possible to help research by themselves getting involved in a trial. I'm very happy to, uh, to agree with the Honourable Lady on that. I mean, if you, if you look at the work that the late Baroness Jowell has done on brain cancer, one of the points she makes, obviously, around stimulating new research projects coming forward in that space, which she, she has been incredibly successful before and since subsequent to her death, she also spoke a lot about clinical trials. And, you know, anybody faced with a cancer diagnosis uh, where, where there isn't a, a treatment or a, a significant treatment would, of course, want to you would want to load the gun with the trial bullet. There are challenges there. Um, you know, pe 
there is only, there's only so much that one can do. There is a toxicity ch- issue around moving from trial to trial that patients don't always fully appreciate. And I think, but in consultation with, with one's oncologist and one's physician, absolutely, it has a really, really critical role to play. And, and without trials, we wouldn't have any of the treatments that we have that we have today. So thank her for raising it. Now, my humble friend in opening the debate talked about um, women's cancers, so such as breast and the, and the gynae cancers, the gynecological cancers, perhaps get more government attention. And I, I suppose... I have to say I disagree here a bit, Madam Deputy Speaker. So, so last April, the Prime Minister pledged £75 million towards clinical trials for prostate cancer, which will focus on improving the early diagnosis we spoke about, the survival rates that we want to see, as well as exploring very different options for different treatments for men affected by the disease. And we expect 40,000 men will be recruited to new research projects um, with this cash boost. And I hope it demonstrates our ongoing commitment to male cancers as well as female cancers. I also would say that I am the first guy to hold the post of public health minister in a long time. I don't know, possibly ever. But I, I, uh, there are um, an awful lot our focus on female cancers, and that is, that is true. But I, I am determined to to raise the bar on on men's health generally, but on but on male cancers, which is why I was very pleased to mention that all party group. So, just just continuing on research and concluding on this point. So, so alongside the the seventy five million pound that I mentioned in twenty sixteen seventeen, the NIHR Clinical Research Network recruited patients to over ninety trials, which is the point that the the, the honourable lady raised and other studies on prostate cancer. So there's a lot of trials in this particular, in this particular place. And the, the NIHR Biomedical Research Centre at the Royal Marsden here in London and the Institute for Cancer Research also got a five-year, £3.1 million prostate cancer research theme ongoing. And we hope to see these deliver more personalised diagnosis, treatment and care for, for men with prostate cancer through better understanding of the molecular. And I started the speech, didn't I, by saying that we're not, we don't know everything about prostate cancer, but better understanding the molecular, molecular and the genetic pathways that determine the non uniform nature of prostate cancer and the prostate testing for cancer and treatment the protect t trial was the largest publicly funded clinical trial ever to take place in the uk and nihr funding to date is 40 million pounds so it's, it is quite significant madam deputy speaker mm. two other points and then uh, then we'll draw it to a close so my humble friend talked about workforce Absolutely, the NHS is nothing without the 1.3 million staff that patients depend on day and night, and nowhere is that truer than for cancer patients. We will not achieve our cancer ambitions without an increased cancer workforce. That's why the Secretary of State has commissioned Baroness Dido Harding, working closely with Sir David Behan, who used to lead the CQC, to lead a number of programmes to engage with key NHS interests to develop a detailed workforce implementation plan. Now, now Baroness Harding and Sir David will present initial recommendations to the Department in March. March of this year, and this will consider detailed proposals to grow the workforce rapidly alongside the implementation of the NHS long-term plan, including that um, early diagnosis of cancer target that I, that I mentioned. My humble friend it connected to this mentioned cancer nurse specialists, so Health Education England is working to expand the number of CNS specialists and to develop develop their competencies and routes into training. This will see every cancer patient having access to a CNS or other support worker by 2021, which I think he would agree is, is very good. Madam Deputy Speaker, some of the stuff that we've covered today is just, just some of the many initiatives that our, the government is undertaking in our significant efforts to tackle prostate cancer. For many of our constituents, including my friend, I hope that I have given the House some information today and a promise of some more, that the government remains totally committed to maintaining and improving the cancer survival rates that we currently have and that prostate cancer is the second biggest cancer killer amongst men is right at the top of that list of priorities. Finally, I couldn't close without paying tribute to, to Prostate Cancer UK, led by Angela Colleen and the work that they do on research, on early diagnosis, and just supporting men with prostate cancer, that they're not alone, and that there is, there is often a way out. Um, and after an all clear, uh, the number of times as cancer ministers that I've been told by cancer patients that the, the, the cliff edge of all clear 
was every bit as bad as the uh, original diagnosis. And we need to support people. People are living, due to our successes, people are living um, much, much longer, uh, perfectly normal and full lives after cancer. So we need to do better in that space as well. But I pay tribute to the work that Prostate Cancer UK do. Their work is absolutely invaluable, as is all of those members of, of staff that, that make the NHS what it is. So thank you to everybody for taking part in today's debate. And of course, my honourable friend. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker.